Welcome to Thinking Through Autonomy, a podcast to help you understand the promise and impact of autonomous land and air vehicles in our world. I'm Ken Dunlap, managing partner of Catalyst Go, taking you on this journey. Hear and read more at thinkingthroughautonomy.com. Now it's time to take your hands off the wheel, foot off the pedal, hand off that throttle, and let's go. Welcome back. We're here with John Coyle, author, innovator, and Olympian. And in this episode of Thinking Through Autonomy, we'll be focusing on designing for individual strengths, designing better teams, and we'll talk a lot about John's Design Thinking Academy. John, welcome back. I'm glad we didn't scare you away the first time. <laughs> glad to be here, Ken. Thanks for having me. You're an Olympian. We've talked about that before. You're the leader of the pack. And my first thought before I really ever opened your book about designing for strengths was that I would not find the word quit anywhere in this <laughs> and that the word quit would not be part of your vocabulary. Yet you say persistence is awesome until it's stupid. Tell us a little bit about stupid persistence. Well, we are wired, well, we coach, we're, we're operant conditioned since we're kids to never quit things. And that's really good advice because kids will quit stuff really quickly. My, my daughter would have quit basketball about seven minutes into the first practice. She got off the court. She was crying. She didn't know some of the language and didn't know what was going on. And so we coach kids to never quit, to keep going. Never, you know, quitters never prosper. Good things come to those who wait. Um, all this advice we're giving as kids, it's very good until it's not. And this notion that we should never quit anything can, can actually take over and we, we latch on to something early in life that maybe isn't our path and we don't let go of it because we're trained never to quit. And maybe you were supposed to be an artist or a musician or an academic or an author and instead you're an accountant or not to, to, to say podcaster. Yeah, right. not to say that any, all the other things are bad. It's just what should be your path given your natural strengths, inclinations, and passions. I think a vast majority of people, to quote Thoreau, um, live quiet lives of desperation. I remember reading in your book about something called the Stanford Marshmallow Experiment. Mm -hmm. And it's about seeing if a kid can understand that if you delay your satisfaction a little bit, there will be more rewards at the end. How does that, how does that all fit into persistence and, and making sure that you're not doing something stupid by just persisting too long? Well, the Stanford Marshmallow Experiment is a really great longitudinal psychological behavioral study that started in 1972, give kids between five and eight years old the choice of one marshmallow now or two in five minutes. And then they've just kept studying them, these kids that are now in their 50s. And uh, what they found is that the ability to delay gratification has led to some pretty striking results in that uh, the two marshmallow kids have been more successful in almost every measurable way. Uh, education level of uh, income, health, relationships, you name it. Uh, the ability to delay gratification has led to good things. But as we talked about, I think there's a point where that same advice, that same guidance, that same persistent thought about never giving up and never giving in and never quitting becomes really bad advice because if you lean into something that's not your forte, it's not your natural strength, then you're actually pursuing something that is a weakness and that's when life gets pretty, pretty dim. So let's, let's talk about that. Let's talk about how we excel as individuals or maybe how we should excel. Um, why are we so fixated on fixing our personal flaws? I mean, Part of me says, well, that's just intuitive because Ken doesn't want to go through life or John doesn't want to go through life with a flaw. But yet, we always seem to spend a lot of energy on that. Are, are we doing the right thing when we're focusing on flaws? I would put it this way. It's perfectly adaptive for children and even young adults. But at some point, or is, is this, I can't attribute this quote, but I love it. If you're over 25 and you're still trying to fix your weaknesses, that ship has sailed. <laughs> Okay. At, at some point, you, you are who you are. You are molded. Your prefrontal cortex is done evolving. And even though the brain is plastic, you're just not going to be the person that you weren't designed to be. You can't overcome some of these things. And here's the really sort of magic ingredient, ingredient to me is that strengths and weaknesses are often they're facets of the same thing. If you are a strategic, big picture, patterns thinker, 
you're probably bad with details. If you are creative, you're probably disorganized. If you are direct and honest, you're probably blunt and rude. If you are detail oriented, you're probably a perfectionist. If you are practical, you're probably critical. I could go on and on and on. These things are facets of the same thing. And trying to fix them actually unwinds your superpower in the first place. And this is, you know, what I experienced in my Olympic career. I can tell you that story if you'd like in a minute. But when you try to fix true weaknesses, you actually destroy the corresponding strength. And that's so damaging in every possible way. So is the mistake we make using the word fixed or is the mistake that we make misidentifying what we should be working on? I would say it's both. I, my experience with teams in corporate environments and outside corporate environments is when you can identify people's actual true strengths and when you can have them spend more time on those things and, and then delegate, defer, or design around the things they're not good at, the, the productivity and culture in terms of, of investment uh, goes through the roof. People love to do what they're good at. They love it. And they hate to do things they're bad at. And it just sucks the life out of a team to play whack-a-mole with weaknesses all day. So if I'm going to race my strengths, what's the first step I need to do? How do I look in the mirror and say, this is a strength and this is a weakness. I'm over 25 and I shouldn't even touch that one. <laughs> how, yeah. how does that work? It's, su it's super hard. This is the thing with strengths is they tend to be very specific and they're hard to identify. They're imp almost impossible to know at first blush. And so it's, it's sort of a patterns game. It takes time. And you can start with the easy things. Take Myers-Briggs, take Colby, take Strengths Finder. Those are really blunt instruments, but they'll get you directionally aligned with where your energy should be. But, you know, being a good communicator, okay, that's, that's a place to start. I'm sure, of course you are, Ken, but oh, you know, to whom, but to whom about get what? you back to episode number three. <laughs> but to whom about what? Are you good with a big audience, a small audience? Are you good with details? Are you good at taking complex things and making them simple or looking at simple things and finding the inherent complexity. You're better with um, stories and narratives. Are you better with data and analytics? Or maybe you're better as a facilitator with groups and pulling things out of people. Or maybe you're better on one-on-one. -on -one. And if so, are you a coach or a challenger or a listener? Like all of these are good communication skills, but they're all fundamentally different. And so honing in on your strength superpowers is not easy. And it's, it's a piece of work that most people don't do. And I will tell you the shortcut that most people will not do because it's so scary. What's that? But if, if you send an email to 10 people that know you really well and ask them for your true strengths and weaknesses as an individual, you're going to like the first list. You're not going to like the second, um, but you can get some pretty good answers to help you work. And you'll also find that probably your strengths and weaknesses are facets of the same thing. Oh, that's the most terrifying thing you can do. I mean, we, right? we used to call that 360 <clears throat> feedback. Yes, yes. <laughs> and whenever I was asked to provide that, I thought, uh, do I put down what I really think or do I put right. down what I think will be beneficial to the person reading this? Right. But your point right. is very well taken about the importance of that. So, um, you know, even though I kind of say, boy, that's scary, I, I can tell you that I have seen a lot of benefit in the corporate environment to doing that. For sure. If you can hone in on what that is, then you can double down on it and you design your career, your life, your team, your everything for doing more of that. And when you get to do more of that, man, do you shine. People resonate with people that are living in, the, in their strengths. Now, this kind of hits something that we're all familiar with called the 10,000 hour rule because I am actually doing that right now. I, I have a couple activities or one that I do where I know that if I practice this 10,000 hours, I will master it. And I, I would like to hope that it's a strength and I would like to hope that in about 7,000 more hours that I actually have the skill mastered. How does the, the cultural impact of the 10,000 hour rule hit with the reality of the school of design thinking and designing for strengths and your experience as an Olympian? Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that you had to have a good baseline before you put in all of that training, to become a great speed skater. What's the intersection of all this, John? 10,000 gets so me I have anything? A, I have a strong opinion on this one, and uh, it's pretty divergent from current wisdom. So Anders Ericsson is on record basically saying that just pick something, put in the 10,000 hours, and you'll be a master of it. And I Absolutely. Fundam yep. I fundamentally disagree. I don't think that's true at all. And I don't think that meets anybody's intuitions. I think that we all have a sense that we have some innate strengths and some innate weaknesses. 
And if I was to right now choose to become a Olympic swimmer or rewind 20 years, it would never happen. It would never happen. I have no, no talent for that. So here's, here's the way I would unwind or sort of recast that. I think it gets back to design thinking. I think asking what it, what it takes to be an Olympian or be a master of any particular subject, um, that answer is very clear. It is the 10,000 hour rule. That, that's for sure true. There's nobody that's been a master of anything without putting in the time, be it from Mozart to Bill Gates to anyone. They've all put in the time. They've, they've, they've demonstrated that they're willing to put in time. But I think a better question is why – why does anybody bother to do 10,000 hours of diligent practice? Practice, diligent practice in particular, is difficult. It's frustrating. It puts you at the edge of your capacity day by day by day. And I think the why question is more important. And I think that actually gets back to native strengths. Because if you are naturally good at something, you will get into the state called the flow. What's that? And flow is a neurological state where there's a couple of a uh, bunch of really important things that happen. First of all, the the hallmark of being in flow, which we've all experienced at some point in our lives, is when time sort of disappears. So you lose yourself in whatever the activity is, and you'll say to yourself, "Oh my God, where did those three hours go?" That's flow. Now, flow also has a neurochemical component, which is that you move through these following chemicals flow into your system: ephedrine, serotonin, dopamine, andonamide, and then oxytocin. The five most addictive chemicals known to man, also known as, when externally introduced, as uh, meth, heroin, cocaine, pot, and uh, ecstasy. Oh, my. And just so our listeners know, we're not promoting the use of those drugs. (laughs) No, no. We are are promoting that you can self-create those in the flow state. Yeah. And this is what drives people. This is my belief, and I think uh, the science is going to follow that people pursue diligent practice, which is a hard thing to do, because they're getting a operant conditioning reinforcement of these chemicals when they do something really well. If you never are good at something, you'll never get the flow state. And so you stumble into, oh, I can play piano, or you stumble into, oh, I can throw a baseball, or you stumble into, I can turn left on skates, go fast, and suddenly you want to do this because you're absolutely consumed with, re, with getting back to that state. And as the author of the book, Flo, um, Michele Cheek Sent Me High says, he believes that, and this is a near quote, it's not quite right, that for all of eternity, all mankind has ever sought is this state. Now, certainly some confirmation bias there. But if this is a really powerful reinforcement for activity, then finding your native strengths, leaning into them, getting into the flow state, getting that operant conditioning feedback loop and the neurochemicals involved can lead to the ability to finally put in the 10,000 hours in something you're naturally good at. That's my perspective. I really understand and appreciate that. And that, I guess, kind of goes in parallel with something that actually shattered me, which is your two-year rule. Yeah. And for for our listeners, the two-year rule, and I'm going to paraphrase you here a little bit, John, and then um, have you jump into this. But if you've tried something for two years and it doesn't work, you're probably doing the wrong thing. And to me, that that is in collision with everything that I've been taught, that if it was a book, keep trying, trying to write it. So where did you, what experience led you to come up with this? I was really thinking hard about, you know, how do you know if you're good at something? And you can't know in two weeks, generally speaking. You can't know probably in three months. You can learn to be a great baseball player, a basketball player, or a violinist, or, or, or accountant, or or anything in a short period of time. But at some point, if you're facing down something that you've been pursuing for a decade, there's something fundamentally wrong there. You're frittering your life away in pursuit of something. And and the insight really came, and you referenced it maybe, uh, I read a book, they sent me a book, and it was 35 success stories. And one of the 35 was this woman that spent 30 years trying to write books with no success, no publishing. And finally, in her late 50s, she had a book published and this was heralded as a success, but the backstory was she was living in trailers and was depressed for a vast majority of her life. How could that possibly be a success? So I, uh, through my experience and just observation, I think around two years into anything, you can make a decision to decide that 
if I'm not seeing progress, progress, if I'm not seeing results, if I'm not feeling and getting into the flow state, then it's probably time to do one of three things. One is quit, just stop doing it and do something else. And that can be a job, that can be a career, it can be a major, it can be a hobby, or design a different approach. Sometimes that's the right thing. Just how do I go about this differently? Maybe I'm just approaching it the wrong way. Or third is you make it a hobby. Uh, that's what golf is for. You don't have to be <laughs> okay. great at everything yeah. that you do, um, but you don't want, particularly in two areas of your life, you don't want your primary source of income and you don't want your primary relationship to be areas of weakness. And so you need to make sure that you're leveraging your strengths in those capacities. Now, you talk about something called the T-shaped person. What, what's, what's the T-shaped person? So the T-shaped person is, is a construct. I, I think it sort of evolved out of design thinking. But as you want to have a broad background and lots of different types of exposures and experiences so that you can call upon different ways of thinking when faced with the problem. If you are always... Uh, narrowly focused in your life, your career, your background, and your education, then you can't possibly consider alternate perspectives. You can only see your own. So this is a path to empathy. However, that's not enough. You also want to be super deep in one or two or three areas so that you can have expertise to solve a specific set of problems. You don't want to be solving every single problem around the world. You want to have an area of expertise. And so, you know, if you're an oceanographer or you're an anthropologist or you're a scientist or you're a neuroscientist, what have you, you want that deep expertise, but having the deep expertise isn't enough because if you don't have a broad background in a variety of different topics and thoughts and perspectives and patterns, then you can't call on that to have empathy, whatever situation you're solving for. And so that, that's where a T-shaped person is a great problem solver. The best problem solvers, the best creative thinkers in the world have really diverse, broad backgrounds and a really deep, intense focus on one particular set of knowledge. And is that an argument for saying that you should have a BA in college rather than a BS? It might be. I don't know. Um, it might be. I mean, I have a BS, but, you know, they at least back then, and I, I haven't obviously been to college in a while, but they still made us take a whole broad set of, of, of subjects in college. And, and that was very useful, I think, particularly in product design, to have that broad background. Um, but there is the risk. I know there's a real tendency these days for – you know, to really focus and get really deep expertise in one area. And that's fine if you're going to just be a worker in that field. But if you want to be an innovator, if you want to be somebody that generates ideas and can think outside of the box, I think the broad background is essential. Okay. That's what it means to be a T-shaped person. And I suspect if you're a person who trains their strengths, gets into the flow, at some point, you're going to be tossed into a corporate work environment where you're made part of a team. And you've had some really yep. interesting commentary across your books and, and your TEDx lectures. One of the things that you say, most companies and managers hire for diversity of talent, experience, and background, and then they waste it. How are we wasting our time? How are we wasting these folks who are in the flow and, and training their strengths? What What's the mistake you're seeing being made? Yeah, I see it again and again. And I'll just give you a specific example from my own career. I led marketing for a wireless company. And while I was there, I had, for example, I had eight marketing managers, all, all the same job title and job description. And they led individual teams themselves. And because it was fair, I had them all do the same tasks, the same activities, the same things. Now, the reality is I hired eight fundamentally different people with different backgrounds, different skills, different strengths, different experiences. And then I force fit them into the mold that was created by the job description. And it was fine until I realized and read Now Discover Your Strengths by Marcus Buckingham. And I realized maybe maybe we could just rejigger and have people double down on what they do best. And, and we, we did sort of two things. We created a team that was, air quotes, unfair because suddenly people with the same job description were doing different things. But I had the spreadsheet people do spreadsheets. I had the creative people do creative stuff. I, I had uh, the operators do the programs and the plans. Like I had the different people leaning into the things they were naturally good at. And our productivity, our scores, our culture, everything went through, through the roof. So hiring for all that experience, diversity, and background and not then letting them lean into it is a huge waste. 
And we work so hard to hire for diversity of experience, background, and, and so forth and so on. And if you don't actually give them the capacity to do those activities that they're best at, then you've totally wasted it. And you're just force fitting people into mold. So when you're putting together a team, what are some of the tools you use to recognize the individual strengths? What are the tools that you use to leverage all of the sum of the individual strengths into a high performing team? How does a, a should a typical manager approach that? We started with doing Myers Briggs and Strengths Finder, and we put that actually on everybody's office door. So you'd sort of walk into somebody's office and sort of know the way they're going to show up. And then from there, we did later, we did a 360, you mentioned that before, we did a 360 where we got uh, reviews on the top five strengths and weaknesses uh, that were, no name was associated. So it was, you know, it was, is, you didn't have to be fearful that somebody would sort of see through and know who was giving you the feedback. And from there, we really then doubled down on, okay, this is the way you show up. This is the way you lead. This is the way that you're going to be the best person for this team. And we're going to rejigger as best we could. You can't obviously just do everything you're good at all the time. You know, the reality of the work environment requires you to be broader than that. But uh, one stat that I've heard that I can't corroborate yet, but I've heard and I think it's right, is if you spend at least a third of your day in your areas of strengths, you have triple the willpower of people that don't. And so we just, man, the, the, everything went through wow, the roof yeah. in terms of the, the team dynamics and the energy and the productivity and, and, and everything. It was just a joy to be, be a part of that work environment. So, John, I, I have to think, based on my experience with a great many companies, small, medium, and large, that the discussion of how can we become more innovative occurs, if not on a daily basis, mm. a, a weekly basis, right? Right. And if you're the head of a company, intuitively, I can tell you, you can't solve your innovation problems if you just hire a head of innovation. But what are some of the things that need to go in place in the corporate environment in order to start and put your company on a trajectory to get more innovative and to build on the strengths of those team members that you have and, and rebuild your teams and properly orient them? What do you need to do? Well, you know, there's a there's a there's kryptonite swirling in the hallways of most large companies around the world right now. And it's, it's so damaging and evil, even, I would use that word. And it all comes from a place of good intent. There is a, there's an innovation-killing leadership style that is pervasive, and, and nobody can see it. It's invisible almost. But I can see it, and as soon as I share what it is, you'll see it as well. And this is this, this thing that happens... And the, the, the construct is called the knower versus the learner, and you sort of ignore, ignore those uh -huh. dic yeah. dictionary definitions. But most leaders get to their place of leadership to be able to lead other people by being, being experts, right? So you get really good at something, you know your stuff, and you get promoted, and suddenly you have a team. And the, the instinct is to then use your knowledge for the good of the team by knowing stuff. And so you... You feel like you've earned your position through your knowledge, and so you want to share it. So that all sounds great. Sounds good. Except it's that. be good. Except that, right? Except that when you judge the ideas of others in a room, there's a, a very specific cognitive response that when you judge the ideas of others in the room at peer level or lower, they emit the stress response, they emit cortisol, and they shut down. So here's how it goes. This is probably the worst yeah. thing uttered in, in any uh, hallway or boardroom around the Let's world Let's see right if now. any of our listeners have been there. Let's hear that. Yeah. So here's the phrase. Somebody throws up an idea in a meeting, and you say from a good place of good intention, oh, that won't work. We've tried that before. Now, unwittingly, you're actually judging that idea, and you're shutting that person down. So they go into cortisol mode, and they shut down in the present tense. Now, do they bring you another idea? Yes, of course, but not in public anymore. They don't want to be shut down in public again. So they come to you in private and they give you another idea and you say, oh, we don't have the budget for that. Again, all from a place of good intent. Do they bring you the third idea? Uh, maybe, maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> okay. Eventually they shut down permanently. You get no more ideas from your people 
And then the triple whammy is eventually they leave because we all know that people join companies but leave managers. And the number one reason that people leave managers is, air quotes, my boss is not open to my ideas. So this hideous kryptonite swirling in hallways as we judge ideas that come out of people's mouths from a place of good intent when the right response has to be curiosity, openness. And here's the other thing about the, oh, we tried that before. I've heard that phrase uttered so many times, and a lot of times the we tried that before is literally 20 years ago. Oh, and the world hasn't changed? <laughs> right? Like, no, just because we tried it 20 years ago does not mean that this is not possible now. And, and so having the willingness to ask more questions and say, oh, so that's an interesting idea. Have you, have you run that past legal? Have you, have you talked to the sales team? Um, have you looked at what the budget would require for that? Like having curiosity versus immediately shutting them down with your expertise is, is ultimately innovation kryptonite and it's killing large companies the world over. And I'm pretty sure that's why Blockbuster went into business. Point well taken. Do you think that there are companies that just can't innovate because their cor corporate cultures are so old and, and their executives are so entrenched that just trying to become more innovative winds up being a destructive process and you, you're better off left alone. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's happening, right? Like, uh, you know, 20 years ago, the average tenure of a Fortune 500 was 40 years. Um, today it's 18, and the trend is in the next day, decade that Fortune 500's lifespans will be 12 years. So two guys in a garage somewhere, two gals in a garage somewhere, are putting giant companies out of business faster than ever. And if you think about it, it really makes no rational sense. The giant companies have all of the capital resources, money, uh, access to expertise, and ability to buy every two gal in a garage company or world over. But they get so entrenched in their inability to see possibility and they, they force fit everybody into this operator knower mindset that all creatives leave and they can't see the changes in their environments, and then they go to business. So I, I, it's totally happening. And the other thing is, this is particularly, I think, particularly apt for millennials. Millennials are not going to stay with a company where their ideas are not valid. They, they'll just leave. They are so willing to just step out and walk away. And so keeping talent that is creative in this modern day world is harder than ever in big companies. And you, you see it vast majority of millennials prefer to be in a startup type environment. Oh, absolutely. And with some of the executives that I've talked to, they're especially thrilled that they can get someone to last two to three years. And right. <laughs> by, the, by the end of the third year, they're already writing off that employee as someone who's ready to move on. But let, let me just, let's give the benefit of the doubt to executive and management teams here for a second. Sure. Um, and, and maybe focus the conversation a different way. Most leaders will hear this. They will have an employee come in and they'll talk about the fact that the culture is risk averse. Nobody wants to take a risk. I think we touched on that a little bit. How, how do we separate the idea that, yes, as a company, we can't take risk from maybe an employee that is actually worried about other things, you know, whether it's their pay, whether they're uh, not getting enough recognition in the workplace, whether maybe the benefits are not what they expected. And so they go and they roll this into a bucket and they say, well, this is a risk averse culture. How, mm -hmm. how do you make that? Is it possible to, to separate the two and find out, hey, this is the real problem that this employee has? Yeah, I think it's 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 totally possible, but it's it's a little bit of um, gosh, it's uh, somewhat somewhat counterintuitive. And the way the word I would use is stewardship. And so what I mean by that is a good steward of the business particularly in senior leadership, recognizes that they, they actually need to do two completely opposite things. And what are those? One is you need to operate with efficiency, effectiveness, and low risk, right? You need to do the core of the business as effectively as possible and winnow out cost and constantly reduce cost and get better at what you're doing and operate with incredible effectiveness. And then you need to take the money, and this is where things go off the rails, you need to take the money that you just squeezed out of that efficient process, and I won't say throw it in the air, but that's what it's going to feel like to some people, and you need to invest it in high-risk things. You need to invest in higher-risk things anyway, into more innovative things that can and will fail. It's sort of like this. This is You think about where you put your money. You don't put all your money in 
in a month in a in a in a CD and expect fifteen percent returns. You 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 can't possibly do that. And it's the same with your inv- innovation investments. You can't put everything into low risk activity and expect high returns. You have to have a portfolio of your invest your investments into innovation. If you're not taking some higher risk activities that have the proclivity to fail, then you're doing it wrong. And that's where good stewardship of the business comes in and you say, yes, we're going to squeeze operations, we're going to get more efficient and effective, and we're going to invest in things that will probably fail. And that's part of what we do. So let me just, you touch on a couple areas here, and I just want to go into these in a little bit more detail because I think you have some really interesting insights in this. So if you're a manager and you say exactly what you did to your teams and say, this is what I'm looking for. And you say, I'm looking for a breakthrough performance from this team, or I'm mm-hmm. looking for a breakthrough performance from you as an individual. How do you realistically align those words, breakthrough performance, with work expectations, life balance expectations? <clears throat> you know, that whole thing to help the employee understand and your colleagues understand what is a breakthrough performance for whether it's a team or whether it's you as a person. Well, in my experience, um, I don't think you necessarily need to define. I mean, you have some goals, of course, um, but breakthrough performance really, at the end of the day, I think comes back to the individual and how they contribute to the team and whether they want to and how committed they are. And and I've found a very striking correlation between commitment to the team with their level of strengths-based activity. So that the more they are doing things they are best at, the more their commitment to the team goes up and the more they're willing to do. And frankly, the less stressful it is, even if they're spending more time. There were periods of time where I was working crazy hours, but I loved what I was doing and it didn't feel like I was overwhelmed or didn't have work-life balance. Uh, And then there were periods of time where I was doing work that I was poor at and felt completely overwhelmed, even though I wasn't putting in nearly as many hours. So the, the sense of stress, the sense of work-life balance, I think is very correlated to how closely aligned are your activities to the environment and your strengths. And I'll just close that with one quick anecdote. I had yeah, a woman absolutely. Raise, raise her hand at a, at a talk, or actually she came up to me afterwards a, a year or two ago, and she said, you know, I'm, I'm direct and honest. I'm a direct, honest, blunt, rude person. That's just the way I'm wired. And I'm really struggling because I'm a school teacher in a private Christian school in Minneapolis. And it just doesn't feel like that strength is valued. And I, I started to laugh. I didn't want to, but I was like, no, I mean, no, probably not. It probably never will be. Like you're in the politest community in the United States in a very uh, soft, probably, um, environment that's not going to be valued there. Now take yourself to an up, upstate New York, um, boarding school, probably valued, but environment and context is absolutely the (laughs) critical element here. You, you, your strengths are not going to shine in certain environments if that environment doesn't value them. Yeah, I think sit down and shut up is viewed differently in right. different environments. <coughs> totally let, true. Let, let me ask you this. At some point, it's been my experience, I don't know if this is universal, but at some point you have to start putting metrics down to figure out if your team is performing properly, if your company is performing properly. Some of those are financial, some of those shareholders know back and forth, um, but other of those will never get seen on a balance sheet. Do you have any like gut measurements on how you can measure the performance of your teams? Is is there a way to do that effectively? That's fair. That's transparent. Yeah, I mean that's it's a hard one. Um, to some to some extent, it it can be a very intuitive thing. Uh, you know, for me, the best measure is uh, for, for me personally, and I think this this is a, a pretty decent rule: is how much of my day disappears in time because when you're in the flow state all of your clocks your internal clocks that measure time they they actually just shut off so you just you're literally not measuring time and that's where you'll face a sort of weird conundrum like you'll say things like oh the you know where did the time go time flew by where did those three hours go or you'll say oh time stood still or both and that's literally just because you weren't measuring it 
So when you're fully into the flow state, when you're fully into your area of strengths, you stop measuring time. So that's a really great hallmark. Now, that's not particularly measurable or documentable. The other ways to measure it can be things like, you know, with feedback scores or culture scores or, you know, assessments of those types right. that start start to get at how does the team feel about the performance of the team, the culture, the group, um, and so forth. Thanks, John. Now, one of the things I, I just heard about was that you have just launched the Design Thinking Academy. Can, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because... Um, it sounds like this may be a really great way to, to take all these nuggets and actually, you know, put them together into a manageable package. But but tell us um, about the, the start and the launching of the Design Thinking Academy. Oh, thank you. Yes. So as I sort of stumble into companies, I have the same conversation over and over again. And it, it's a really that? a fun one. It's a fun one because well, because it positions me and my work in a way that's, that's very um, positive is – I will ask, do you have in your company, and this is larger companies, but I'll ask, you know, do you have a, a leadership development program or a high potential leadership development program or emerging leader program or a hypo program? They have different ta- names for them, but almost every company has in place a set of, of leadership development classes, work sessions, uh, programs to hone and, and help the leaders of tomorrow develop their leadership capacity. And that's a great thing. And I've gone through them myself. But then they'll always, almost always say yes. And then I'll ask them, is innovation important to the future of your company? And the answer is always yes. And then I'll ask the third question, which is, how are you teaching the leaders of tomorrow to be innovative and to lead innovative teams? And it's crickets. It's Mm -hmm. always crickets. Always, always. They've got you know, classes on feedback and strategic thinking and analytics and big data and uh, all of these, you know, servant leadership, all great things. And I wouldn't take anything away from those. I wouldn't. But if innovation is your mission, your vision, your value, it's etched in, etched in the, the granite of your hallways and you're not teaching people basic skills on how to both innovate and lead innovatively, then you're missing the boat. And it's not hard. This is the, great, the greatest thing about what I, I get to do. And this is what's in the online program is when I teach people how to be innovative and how to lead innovatively and how to use design thinking, it is inevitably the course within their program that gets the highest ratings. And the reason for that is people love to be creative. They love to give, be given the freedom to think laterally and to come up with new ideas and, and, and use their imagination and their visual thinking skills and to lean into all these things they used to be able to do when they were kids. And so it's not only fun, it's useful, and it's easily teachable. Design thinking, I can, I can teach people design thinking in an hour. I mean, it's not hard. Now, practice is required. And what's in the course and what I bring to the table is a mix between the frameworks of design thinking, creative problem solving, and so forth and so on, and a series of narratives of stories of, of storytelling that get people highly emotionally connected to the material in such a way that when they're done, they want to practice. And that's the, that's the sort of hack or short, shortcut here is if you can get people to learn a simple framework like design thinking and then want to practice it, well, that's how you can affect change in a very short order. And so I have a, this, this course online. Uh, it's called the Design Thinking Academy, and it's all about how do you lead innovative teams using very, very simple skills, practices, mindsets, and tools it illuminated with stories and narratives that make it entertaining, fun, and um, yeah, it's super fun. Oh, that's that's wonderful. So, our listeners can Google Design Thinking Academy by John K. Coyle. I'll take that right to your um, homepage. And also, they can go to Amazon and either um, download or um, buy a hard copy of Design for Strengths Applying Design Thinking to Individual and Team Strengths. And that'll take folks into a lot more detail that we couldn't get into in the course of these two podcasts. Now, John, you are always welcome to come back for podcasts three, four, and five. Hopefully, we haven't scared you. And I think we we need to devote one to scorpion pepper recipes that you can try without creating a, an EPA Superfund site in your house. How does that work? <laughs> that, that We can definitely do that. And it is all about the amount that you uh, dust off. <laughs> Okay. Well, I will not be taking the scorpion pepper challenge anytime soon. Uh, 
That is not my forte. But in any event, I want to thank you for being a good sport. I want to thank you for the incredible insights that you've given us on design thinking. And I can't wait for other folks to, to go and read your book. You have some incredibly powerful stories in the book. Please read the epilogue to John's book. I made the big mistake of not doing that. And I told John that. I said, well, in order to save time, I usually skip the epilogue. Incredibly powerful part of the book. And uh, John, thank you so very much for being here on Thinking Through Autonomy. Thank you so much, Ken. It was great chatting with you.